I'm going to talk to the end user, the guy whose life is being impacted by this tool and listen to his honest feedback. Something that's unique about construction and people are blunt. There's no filters. Like if, if something's not working, they're going to tell you it's not working. They're going to tell you exactly how it wasn't being effective. And if you can listen, then you can hear the ways that it can be. And if they're saying fundamentally this tool or technology just isn't working, then yeah, you might have to abandon it. Welcome back to Built Different, a podcast and community choosing to approach innovation differently. I'm Grant Hagen. I'm Brian Vizzaretta. And we're on a mission to rewrite the narrative around what innovation truly means. Last season, we did 12 episodes more focused on the field. And this season, we packed up our gear, joining teams in site trailers, offices, and even a few podcast studios, where we focused on the executive level and how innovation is making an impact within their organizations. New this season, we're introducing live streams to invite you to join the conversation. Also, we want to equip you by providing show recaps from each episode in our new Built Different download. Join us August 7th as we continue this journey together. Think different, be different, and build different. Well, welcome back team to Built Different. We are very excited you guys are joining us here for the first episode on season three. Welcome back, Brian. It's good to see you again, my friend. Good to see you as well. Man, it has been an amazing off season here. We took a couple short weeks off to get you guys ready for season three. And wow, season three, Brian, uh, this is going to be a heavy hit in season. Uh, I'm super pumped and I'm really excited to get these episodes out in front of y'all. Yeah, we got a couple surprises that go along with a lot of these podcasts as well. So I'm excited to kind of show those out. So a few things that we're doing different this year, if you didn't catch our trailer uh, a week ago, is really some fun, exciting ways to engage you guys in the community here. So uh, some fun things that we have in store is we're going to be actually doing live streams throughout the season. Uh, so as you guys are taking notes and having questions, we want to engage you guys as a part of the conversation. So be on the lookout for more details around that on LinkedIn. Uh, we're going to have some really fun things with show recaps. Uh, we're introducing this new thing called the Built Different Download. Brian, I know you're a reader, man, and I know you like some good show recaps. Uh, tell me about those. I, I mean, just I think just the more forms of communication we can put around everything and those are going to be more higher level executive like you know takeaways and uh, it's good to kind of keep track of those and compare with what other people kind of are getting from the episodes as well and i'll be honest uh, ai uh, started to come into our worlds a lot faster uh, brian and i have found some really fun new tools to be able to condense and really just summarize uh, a lot of these conversations in a really fun way so i'm personally excited to bring those out uh, in front of you guys too and lastly some new fun things in this season is some really cool swag uh, so we are going to have some really fun giveaways uh, throughout the season as you guys are sharing and posting and uh, really just amplifying some of these quotes and stories that we're capturing here on the episodes. And so, Brian, tell us about this first episode uh, with the Juno team. This is going to be a really fun conversation. So Juno is near and dear to my heart, specifically not just because you introduced me to them, but we got to visit a lot of the job sites. We got to meet multiple, multiple team members. And then on this episode specifically, not only one of the, you know, somebody I think that's truly going to change the industry is Wilson, but we also got a, a, their executive, project executive involved as well. So starting to have these conversations talking about company trajectory at the executive level and not just from the technology person alone is inspiring for, I'd say, for a lot of people out there. Yeah, this was a really fun conversation. Uh, one for a lot of reasons. Brian and I got to spend a ton of time uh, before we recorded this episode out on some job sites to really personalize uh, Juno. They're an amazing company uh, out of the Atlanta area. So Brian and I got to go visit them and they hosted us in their podcast studio, which was just crazy. Uh, we walked in their office and they're like, hey, come on over. We're going to have uh, some fun time in our podcast studio. So and Greg is an amazing person that I'm excited to uh, introduce a lot of folks to as well uh, on the Juno team with Wilson. So Without further ado, we're going to give you guys uh, a little glimpse of this episode here, and we're going to dive right in. So we will see you on the next one. Well, welcome into the Built Different podcast on location. This is uh, this is super exciting. Uh, Wilson, thanks for having us here. Yeah, you're welcome. We're glad to break in the the new podcast studio. Got yeah, we. Office. It's not often that you get invited from uh, one of your customers to come to their podcast studio, uh, and how could I forget? I also, introduce Greg here. Thanks for joining in with us. Absolutely. Uh, this is super fun. Uh, we are here in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, on location uh, for season three here that we're recording, and uh, we're here with Juno. So, Wilson, would you uh, intro us here? I feel like uh, that we are visitors to your home. <laughs> so, yeah, thanks I mean, for uh, letting us come by, and excited to get to talk with you and Greg. Juno Construction, 
what can we say? We, uh, you know, spent some time today going out to a couple of our, our project sites, um, give you guys a peek behind the curtain about the culture and the implementation of all the, the tools and technology that we have at Juno. And, you know, excited to be able to have Greg here with us and give kind of that executive level perspective on what makes technology successful at Juno and, you know, what, what drives the culture that hopefully you and Brian were able to see visiting the job sites. Yeah. Love it. Uh, would love to kick us off, uh, just to kind of, <laughs> we know your guys' role and, and we actually just met Greg. So <laughs> thanks yeah. for, uh, thanks for hopping in here. This is uh, super fun. Would love to hear maybe how long you've been at Juno, what your roles are, and then we'll get into some really good questions of one. Uh, I hope you're ready because I have a lot of questions for you. Uh, and this is really fun too. We don't often get to have, uh, I think someone who is maybe boots on the ground. We were just out on some job sites today. And then uh, you a little bit on kind of the executive level here that just we'll have some really good conversations around technology in general and also uh, just different perspectives. So with that, Greg, yeah, would love to hear a yeah. little bit about your background. Yeah. So I'm, I'm Greg Cornwell. I'm our vice president of operations um, based here in Atlanta. I've been with Juno for about 10 years now. Um, really kind of in, in involved in, in most of our projects kind of from start to finish um, and then involved in a lot of our corporate departments as well. So love it. Yeah. And, and then Wilson over here, Wilson Hayworth, <laughs> uh, virtual design and construction manager at Juno and really kicked off the drone program here and started our partnership with drone deploy, which is, you know, we did that about three years ago and it's what's led to us all being here today and being able to talk to you guys. Yeah, we've been here in Atlanta for a couple days now and got to visit uh, quite a few job sites. I, I don't want to miss. I do this on every episode. I, I forget to intro Brian over here. and I just hang out and ask the hard hitting questions in the background. <laughs> That's all I do. I come in. But yeah. no, yeah. No, I, I, you know, I think over the last couple of days, just visiting Juno, I, you know, a lot of people talk about culture, but truly the culture at Juno is something that has inspired me personally to kind of like you know, reevaluate what culture really means. So. Yeah. Well said. Uh, we're just going to dive into it because we uh, are really interested to ask you guys just a little bit more around what and how technology has impacted your role, Greg. And obviously we got to spend a lot of time with you, uh, with Wilson here, but I'm, I'm curious, give us a little tenure of kind of how you got to your position now. Uh, and then we're going to dive in a little bit more to like specifically technology and the, the really exciting part, I think, of having the two of you guys here is it's not often that some of our listeners that are on get to, or some of our listeners that listen in get to hear two different sides of how technology is impacted, both at a corporate level and then also at a job site level. And so that's really what kind of, I think, the theme of what we would love to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, but before that, I would love to kind of hear a little bit more about your career, Greg, how you got to where you're at now. And uh, and then I'm sure I'll <laughs> have some questions along. Yeah, the way. absolutely. So I started with uh, another company um, out of school and worked there for about five years. Um, and we were doing mostly federal military projects. So I was kind of traveling all over the, the country for, for those projects and then made the change over to Juno. Um, like I said, I've been here for about 10 years now. Um, started as a project manager with Juno um, on a project in Tuscaloosa. And then um, from there, I uh, went down to Miami and built a, a couple of projects down there and then came back up here and have kind of been able to, to advance from there. Um, from technology perspective, kind of to age myself a little bit, but um, when I first started, we were still hard copy submittals, um, hard stamps, redlining every single one. You'd have to uh, transcribe, you know, a submittal seven different times and then, you know, FedEx or courier them to, to wherever the architect's office was. Um, and it was just a very tedious, long process. So from there to where we are now, it, it I guess it's been about 15 years and, and it's come a very long way. So. Yeah. And I guess, Wilson, talk a little bit about your kind of history here and what kind of led you into the position that you're in now. And we'll dive into a little bit more of the specifics of what you do. Yeah. So I, I came in really out of school, going on that project manager route. Didn't know that technology and construction was really a career option and talked with Greg and he's like, I think you need to interview with Jake. And I talked with Jake, our director of virtual design and construction, uh, now the director of innovation and technology, um, talked with him. He's like, don't do this project management stuff. Come spend like six months with me in VDC. I think you've got the right skill set. I think you've got the right mentality. 
to do it. And like six months in, sat down with our COO and the two of them had it out as like, one of them is like, we need him to go be in operations. And Jake's like, but I like, I think he's got what it can take to like build out the technology mm -hmm. that we want to do. And it's got the right mindset to, to implement it. And it really opened my eyes into the possibilities of like the problems we can solve just by thinking about them a little bit differently. And that there's a lot of people like at drone deploy who they spend all their time working on developing products that make our lives easier. And that's been a big thing in our, my job is finding those tools to equip our teams to have the right resources, to be able to work efficiently, work accurately. And ultimately like I view technology as like being this quality of life driver. And so I take a lot of emphasis on making sure we have useful tools that are allowing our operations folks to be equipped to make the decisions themselves and ultimately save themselves time and money and improve their overall quality of life. Yeah, and I'd, I'd say also for me, the drone deploy tool helps me because I'm typically here in the main office most of the time, but I can jump on there just about any day and I can jump in and see you know, exactly where, where the projects are from here, no matter where the project is, and you know, whether it's you know, South Carolina or Tennessee, um, I can jump on there from here and be able to get a good, keep my finger on the pulse of what's happening on each of our sites. Uh, one thing we didn't mention, <laughs> and good, good to mention to you, it, uh, we love talking about technology and just obviously that's kind of a frame of a lot of our conversations, but uh, it, <laughs> this, this podcast has turned into more than a drone deploy spotlight. So mm -hmm. feel free to, uh, <laughs> no, no need for shameless plugs yeah. while we love them yeah. uh, for sure. But uh, I'm curious, one thing that Wilson uh, had alluded to just the last couple of days of spending some time with him is, is really the, the trust that you have had in him and a lot mm -hmm. of the tools that you know he's brought up and processes and, and things that have kind of come along the way since he's been here. I, I'm curious to know, how does that trust get developed? Like how, how when Wilson comes up and kind of says, hey, I got this idea or hey, I, I, I heard this problem uh, on a job site, like where does that sit in your head? Like, how does that go from Wilson bringing something up to you kind of interpreting it, thinking about it being a potential solution, obviously like costs and impact and all mm. the things that come along with that. But like walk some of us through that kind of process, if that makes sense. Yeah. I think to me, it's, it's about, you know, understanding the use case and then Wilson alluded to it earlier, but it's making sure that any solution that we bring to the table is one that's going to make the lives of our people better and not just a cool flashy software or, or you know gadget it's something that's going to make the lives of our people better um, and it's going to make us more efficient and improve the quality of life for our people so you know i think most of the time if, if you have an idea or, or anybody else here that has an idea you know brings it to us and is able to show hey this is something that that is going to save us time it's going to you know make us better it's going to you know make our lives better you know then it's a no-brainer and uh, you know then it's basically go make it happen I've got a, a little story of like how we started with drone deploy and I think it kind of emphasizes Greg's thought process on on technology it was the the Chosewood project that we were working on remember that was being built on on a dump and had to it was, it was a volumetric measurement we needed of this huge stockpile of soils and we had just bought a laser scanner and so everybody's first thoughts like cool we have this nice expensive piece of equipment that should be able to measure all this and so you're like wilson go out in this toxic soil and measure this dirt and we're like okay cool we, we don't need a team of surveyors to do it we just need one guy and i was trudging around in there and it was after a rainstorm and i was like knee high <laughs> in mud and i came back after that day i'm like okay i'm not doing that ever again <laughs> um and i had recently heard somebody at a, a conference and they got asked the question like what's the most important tool in their their tool set and they said a drone so it's like okay let me let me go look into that a little bit because i was just standing that literally knee deep in a dump let's uh let's figure it out and i went to greg i'm like so we're gonna be monitoring this site for a while like let's can we can we look at the software and you know just for one project one use case and that's what what it all started from and got success you know first measurement really funny too uh got the measurement and Royce, unbeknownst to me, had Mike Mamie go survey it and back check my thing because he didn't trust it at all. But 
and I was like, I only found out about it because I was working with Mike Namy on another project, and he told me about that. That he he did. And he's like, your measurements were spot on. It was amazing. Um, but then from there, I was like, right away, it's like, okay, so this works. It's accurate. It's solved problems. It kept me out of the mud. So then it turned into how how can we keep other people out of the mud? And then since then, it's like we have evolved it to be integrated into like every single process we do from like the quality control side um to now like working with drone deploy on the the interiors integration like it's just gone from like measuring dirt was like that was our foot in the door and now we're doing ai interior progress tracking like the evolution is just crazy but it all started with like i was like greg i'm i'm sick of being in the mud and you're like okay <laughs> let's let's get yeah. you out of there i mean i'm I mean, that, like that's an amazing story about success of where you guys got there. But, you know, it takes both of you in this room to make that happen, right? Like it's a two pronged approach. You have you going to job sites, showing technology and showing what you can get done on their sites. And then you also at the operations level, you know, buying into the process, building the culture around the team. Because, you know, if the VDC team is the only people that are capable of doing anything as simple as a 360 degree photo walk or a drone flight, then you know, you start limiting, like, you know, can you talk more about that? Like, how do you kind of? Yeah, I think, I mean, when we first adopted, for example, when we first adopted Procore, it definitely was a transition of getting all of the guys in the field adopted to it, getting them used to using the iPads and the phones. And really, it's just like anything, you know, you got to prove to them that it makes their life easier. Once they realize that, hey, this, this new thing, once I learn it, you know, I got to put in the effort to learn it. But once I do that, then, you know, it saves me time here, here and here. You know that's that's kind of the the mentality it's just if uh if the technology will sell itself you know once once you get it in the person's hands and get to prove to them that it it makes their life easier yeah and, and so you know field wise it seems like the buy-in is there from everything i've seen today and i'd like to know a little bit more about the like the executive buy-in you know how do you get the rest of the company and like you know where did that original initiative come from yeah i would say I would say, I mean, it comes directly from the top of Les and Nancy. I mean, they, they're the ones that ultimately sign off on all of this stuff that we, and all the cool toys that, that we like to, to test out and play with. So, um, it comes directly from them. Um, but they've always been good to, of, of, Hey, you've got an idea, you know, let's, let's test it out. Let's see what, you know, how it works. And, and if it's proven that it makes us better then let's, let's go all in. Mm. I heard, uh, you guys hear me, right? Yeah. You hear me good. Uh, <laughs> One of the coolest things I heard was from your guys' internship program, and I think your interns were presenting to Nancy, and Nancy asked this question of, hey, this is great. I love what you're talking about here. W would you buy this? Would you invest in this software? And it really just speaks to what you're saying of like her trust in the people, yep. uh, ultimately in their trust in what solutions they're wanting to use. And I, I asked Wilson this earlier, but I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. Like, how do you hear about uh it, or i guess let me ask it this way you said hey quality of life like mm -hmm. that's a that's a big that seems to be one of the bigger reasons of what technology you use and what you don't like how do you hear about technology other than maybe a guy like wilson like what circles of uh peer relationships or industry types of things like where are you getting a lot of your knowledge about what the next thing is yeah i would say most of it comes from these guys here i mean they're they're always keeping their finger on the pulse of, of what's out there. And then, you know, also we attend a lot of the different conferences um, and, he, and hear about the, the new softwares and technologies that are out there. Um, and then a lot of word of mouth, you know, somebody may have, have seen one of our, our uh, peers doing something similar or something cool and the different ideas and, and conversations there that just kind of, you know, evolve over time. And would you say it's like <laughs> – what one episode we recorded last season was just talking about how it's almost like an attractor to people now. Like it used to be like the technology was like kind of hidden and you didn't want to like share it with anyone and you kind of wanted it to be your differentiator. But now it almost like attracts companies together of mm -hmm. like, Oh, Hey, what are you guys doing? And yeah. maybe talk about that of like how that's almost been the collaborative part that has like shifted in this kind of space. Yeah. I mean, I think the more heads you get together, the better ideas you come up with. Right. So if we can collaborate, you know, one of our, peers may have a different spin on how they're using one of the tools than we do. And, and then we may be able to, to compare notes and then even add some more ideas to that that makes us, you know, both better as a whole. So I think the, 
the competition, you know, is, is not really necessary in that regard. It's more about making ourselves, you know, constantly making ourselves better and, and being the best that we possibly can at, at building and executing on projects. And so, you know, to me, you know, anything we can do and any, any notes we can share to, to make us better as a company and better as an industry, I think is, is a positive. Yeah. I mean, go for I mean, it. Yeah. You know, having had your experience now going through this process and have seen kind of like the light, you guys are definitely in the futuristic side of top tier, you know, technology as far as GCs go. What advice would you give to yourself going back to it? You know, you know, besides like the skepticism, but also just, you know, how to measure business impact, how to roll things out. You know, what, what advice would you give to yourself in the past? Yeah, I think, I think the biggest thing for, for me is just focusing on, on our people, right? It's all about our people and it's not about, having a cool tool or, or new technology. It's about our people and and how their day-to-day -day lives are, are impacted and we want them to have the best quality of life that they possibly can. And um, then, you know, with that in mind, if we're focusing our tools on on our people, you know, then then we get great ideas out of our people too that help continue to further that and, and make it better and we empower our folks to all come with ideas and, and uh, anybody, there's no bad ideas, bring them to the table. And if, it, if it's something that'll make our lives better, then we'll, we'll, we'll do it. Do you find that that uh, oppositely is true of like, hey, the tools that aren't being effective and aren't improving the quality of life are like quickly fading as well. Yeah. Or are they just like sticking around long enough of like, oh, I don't. Yeah, there's been a few softwares we've tested out over the years that, you know, they were just too time consuming and tedious. And it, it almost created so much more data entry into the tool that it made it well, it's, while the cool the tool was cool and had had nice dashboards and outputs that you could see. Um, all the extra work that had to go into maintaining that and setting it up made it, you know, not not functional and just added more work to our teams. So yeah. it was those those, you know, examples we faded out pretty quickly as you know after we we tested them. This might be a, a joint question, but it, again, just driving home this like quality of life, which I, I love. Like yeah. it should be a factor in anyone's decisions of software or companies or jobs. Like, how do you measure that though? Like, how do you measure if a tool is achieving that or not obviously you have like the narrative side of it of just stories and kind of talking with other people but like i'm sure there's probably a numerical side of it too of feedback surveys and things like that like how how do you guys kind of audit the tools that you're using and if they are effective at achieving that outcome of a better quality of life i mean i hear it just from the first hand stories you know, we, we work to refine our processes to be the most efficient they can be and we always reevaluate it through the lens of is this getting people home to their families on time is it allowing them to deliver high quality work and the two of them are it, it shouldn't be a trade-off and i think that's something i've i've found at juno is like we can still deliver high quality work quickly and efficiently as well um and it, it doesn't have to be a compromise on like the work you the quality of the work you do and then the time suck and so it's it's the conversations like you guys saw us having today on site of i'm going to talk to the end user the guy whose life is being impacted by this tool and listen to his honest feedback is it is it working because something that's unique about construction and if you're in the construction industry you know it is people are blunt there's no filters like <laughs> if if something's not working they're going to tell you it's not working they're going to tell you exactly how it wasn't being effective and if you can listen then you can hear the ways that it can be and if if they're saying fundamentally this tool or technology just isn't working then yeah you might have to abandon it but it's really from that first-hand perspective and the conversations and the feedback and listening to our operations folks that provides me the insight into like what are we doing is that's how i measure it it's it's the look on somebody's face, you know, mm. do, do they take off with a drone and are they smiling while they're doing it? Cause the answer is usually yes. Uh, I, I have a saying that like, there's no bad day when you're playing with flying robots, like, <laughs> um, but it's, it's that firsthand perspective and just listening to our, our operations guys. I mean, you, you brought up a really good point earlier where you're talking about, you know, technology is not this, you know, business development only focus tool, but something that augments the teams to be able to do work more efficiently. You know, how does that kind of play a role now with, you know, some of these much larger projects? And you know, we, we went to two downtown high rises alone, as well as I know there's a couple large projects. I don't know what you can and can't share 
on the yeah. horizon. Like, how does that change the way you approach these newer large projects and the way you even bid them out? So, uh, and can you ask the first part of that again? So, Sorry. well, pretty much like, how has technology played a role in the way you even pursue projects? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it, it, it helps make the whole process easier, right? So, um, from, from the pursuit and the, the business development side, I mean, there's lots of cool things that we can, we can show and, and help our owners, you know, visualize the, the projects better, um, and design teams from, from the start. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of the logistics, you know, coordination and software out there has made, has, has been made a lot easier. We can communicate with all of the stakeholders as far as what our plans are, how the site will work, you know, how we would plan and, and operate in the site and even communicating that to the cities when we need to go get special, you know, permissions to close lanes or roads, we can show them, you know, in, in a model in 3d, you know, what it really is going to look like and how this is all going to flow over time. And, and those sorts of tools, I think make it, it's a selling tool because when the owners see that they're always, you know, kind of blown away by it, but it's also, you know, functional for our teams to be able to sit there and look at it in, in a model and be able to, to actually see it and build it in 3d before, you know, they ever have to go, you know, put a foot on the ground out there. So, yeah, some, something we do at Juno, I think it's it's virtual design and construction as a methodology where we don't gatekeep that information to just one group of people. Um, even like all of our reality capture stuff, most of our reality capture stuff is done by operations folks. It's it's yep. actually un, it's unique where we don't dedicate VDC resources to it more so we enable our operations folks to do it and it's this whole mindset of virtual design and construction and, and technology as a methodology and it's like in the ethos of the company it seems like like yep. you you work at juno and you're, we're going to go build the the biggest highest profile projects in the southeast and want to be known as being able to accomplish the most technically challenging projects it's something that sets us apart and it's based on a foundation that it's not one group of people that uses these tools it's we have the best tools in the business that everybody gets to use mm -hmm. and you know i want, want to talk about our our big hairy audacious goals that we've got um you know you guys greg was instrumental in coming up with with that term a, a bhag a big hairy audacious goal and you know I'll, I'll ask you you know what what are our juno's big hairy audacious goals and how, how does technology come into play with that yeah, I mean, I think the the BHAG is for us, which is our 20 year goal, right, is that we want to be building the highest profile, most innovative projects in the southeast. So to me, that that kind of says we don't want to be all things to all people. We want to be focused in the southeast. This is our home and we want to keep our people close to home. And it's all people focused. Right. Um, and we want to be the best. We don't want to be the biggest. And that's that that focus, I think, on being the best is ultimately something that when you execute at the highest level, you know, then ultimately that that spurs the growth, right? So it's not a focus on a number, it's not a focus on revenues, it's a focus on being the best and, and taking care of our people. And then from there, the, the rest, you know, the revenues and the, the profits take care of themselves after that. Uh, uh, I wanna go back to uh, the measure. I have one question that I wanna right turn us a little bit here. <laughs> the question of how are you measuring if it's improving the quality of life. I, yeah. uh, Wilson's obviously getting to go out and hear the stories. Is that translated to you of like, hey, these are the right tools that we're still continuing to use or do you have other ways that you kind of gather that information too? Yeah, I think for me, it's it's really just, is the tool being used, right? Is it something that the, the teams, because we're not forcing technology on anybody and that's that never works, right? So we provide the tool and then show them how to use it. And then if, if it's something that makes their lives better, they're using it. And that's just kind of, the simple answer is that, you know, we measure it by, is it being used? And if it's not being used, then it's not helping in the quality of life clearly. So it's not worth, worth the investment. Yeah. Well said. Uh, I want to take a little right turn. <laughs> it's small. Uh, you've been around long enough to have kind of seen some of these different, let's call them waves of technology. Right. And I'm not that I'm aging you Wilson <laughs> by any means. Uh, but so paper copies, submittals, rubber stamps, right. Mm -hmm. The next I'm going to, classify these as waves because i got to see these in some ways coming through the industry too uh let's talk about blue beam right yep. kind of digitizing that paper version maybe a stamp that you can put on a pdf right and then let's talk about another wave of procore mm -hmm. like okay 
we're kind of transitioning out of these a little bit segmented, not cloud-based PM tools. I, I want to hear your thoughts on kind of what we think is this third wave of technology of just reality capture. You mentioned mm -hmm. it earlier of, I can sit here in Atlanta, see any job in South Carolina, see any job across town that maybe I couldn't get to with Atlanta traffic. And like, do you, do you see that as kind of this next grouping of way? Like I was out on some jobs and everyone has Bluebeam on their machine, obviously like yeah. great tool, right? Talk about Procore. Everyone's using it from your trade partners to you guys as well. Like, is reality capture a category that's kind of forming slowly too? Or I, I would just be yeah. curious to hear your kind of, your yeah, thoughts. I mean, I think a hundred percent cause it, it's, I mean, it's used in a lot of different ways, right? I mean, uh, quality control for us, for example, with being able to, um, you know, capture the data on a, on an elevated podium deck before we, we pour to be able to, you know, know what's, what's where in that deck for, you know, future, if we ever need to, you know, cut back into it, we have that data there of knowing exactly what's in, in it and then we can also do the overlays where we are able to then see okay are all these embeds in the right spot you know on the deck before we um before we pour so it's another level of, of quick quality control that's much faster than you know, guys have to go out there in the field and check everything with the with the measuring tape so um i think there's so many examples of that from a quality control uh, from even being able to go back when you when you do have issues being able to go back and tell what's in the wall i mean uh for example you know, we've we've had issues with with leaks and walls in, in the past. You know, you it's uh it's great to be able to go back and just look at the the reality capture and be able to see that hey, this is exactly where that pipe is. I, I can cut a hole now that's you know six inches, not you know three feet, and and it just saves time and and money by being able to have that documentation. So it's I mean it's already proven itself to me. So I think it's it's definitely going to be continue to, to to grow and will be a, a big wave for sure. Yeah, but I mean, t but to your point as well is it has to be as quick as pulling up on my phone in the mm -hmm. next 30 seconds, or I'm just going to take this hammer and make four holes and then have someone come patch it up. Yep. Cause if that, if it's not quicker than, than making three to four holes, then the three to four holes is going to win. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. I, what's your thoughts on that? Wilson of just kind of this next, <laughs> I, I, I dated you maybe a little bit too much cause you probably don't remember life before blue beam, but we do. Yeah. <laughs> and it was not fun. Kudos to Bluebeam, big fans. But yeah, I mean, like, what have you kind of seen as this next? Uh, you think of like these core tools that you use at an operations level, right? Mm -hmm. Definitely would put an ERP system up there, a mm -hmm. Procore up there from project management. Like, Reality Capture is becoming its own, like, company core category of a, a platform, whatever one you want to use, if it's segmented across different point solutions or a single solution that's, you know, gathering all that together but i'm curious if your kind of perspective around that too yeah i mean i see it right now being it's a cya tool like the the justification for the return is you solve one problem you've paid for that solution and where we're taking it is proactive how and like that's where it, it ties into juno's BHAG goals and our our culture of caring about our people is we want this thing not to just solve one problem and help mitigate a leak in a wall, but we want it to be used daily, every single day, and not just to document stuff, but to actually make decisions off of it. And we want Reality Capture to be ingrained in everybody's day-to-day -day process where we're augmenting our people to not just be builders, but have this just massive database of documentation to look back on so that every single decision that somebody makes is an informed decision founded in the truth. And there's, there's nothing more true than a picture. You know? And mm -hmm. I've, I've got this saying with, with drones, um, you know, pictures worth a thousand words and our drone maps are comprised of hundreds of pictures. Just think of how much mm -hmm. truth there is to a, a drone flight with it. And you know, that the next wave of reality capture is being proactive with it and not Oh, we had a problem. Here's what the cause was. Let's make it quickly. It's it's mitigating that problem from ever happening in the first place. I mean, how how do you keep up with the internal education? Not I mean, not just at the field level, but at the executive level. Like, how do you also internally just share what's going on? Like, we're spending this money on these things, right? Like, it just looks like a line item. Like, what what are we getting out of this? Yeah, I mean, um, I think it's a constant it's a constant learning thing, right? Trying to stay on 
on top of all the different changes that and i mean i don't know how to use every single one of these tools that these guys do i won't lie about that i mean they know how to do this stuff way better than i do and way faster i can get in there and navigate it and i can find the information i need because they've showed me how to do that and that's kind of we've trained everybody to be able to do that but um you know yeah it's 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 just a constant continuing to to learn and stay on top of it i, I had an experience recently that that made me super proud so you know this office we've got big glass walls being transparent between the meeting rooms and i saw our concrete project manager our soon to be retired coo and one of our senior supers in a room by themselves no no young people they had one of our concrete validation models pulled up on the tv no nobody asked them how to do it no they didn't ask anybody how to do it they they just knew like okay we've got this tool it's there the model was upside down so i was like it's a start like but they were trying yeah they're right. like the this upside down model is a better piece of information than an uncoordinated plan set and they knew it they knew they weren't gonna you know they're they're okay laughing at themselves being like i can't navigate this thing yeah but they were trying and but and we and we know what the tools are right what tools we have and what they can do and what they're capable of. And then, you know, we know who to call when we, when we need them. So, <laughs> and, but what I loved about it was they didn't call me. Yeah. They just did it. Yep. They just, they just pulled it up and we're using it. And it was years of badgering them to be like, Hey guys, we have this really great tool. And then finally on like the biggest project in company history, it's there. It's, mm -hmm. it's all the pieces fell into place and they're using the tools that are available to them without having to ask what is available to me. I'm curious, Greg, on, uh, I keep talking about the South Carolina project. Mm -hmm. uh, one, because it's probably one of the best and most comprehensive beginning to end, inside, outside, aerial ground, all, all things documented it, within DronePoint, which has been really fun to see even early, early days mm -hmm. of where we were trying to go and push some of this stuff. Like, Tell me some stories about that job around how you guys were able to capture or what some of the things that maybe you caught uh, with doing. I, I love the perspective of like, hey, reality capture today is CYA. Reality capture tomorrow is proactive. It's like, hey, yep. we, we are using this as a part of our team, our meetings. Uh, I, I'm curious. I mean, you were obviously yeah. so close to that job. Like, tell us some stories that kind of stand out. For yeah. Me. So, I mean, right out of the gate, we we started using it with, with during our site work package. There was a um, we had a lot of unsuitable soils that came up and we were able to, you know, quantify those. We were able to basically, you know, map that out on the drone, um, video to show the owner exactly where the, where the, the bad stuff was and show them the, the depth we thought it, that we were going to have to excavate it and the, the assumed quantities that were, were there. Um, and then when we went and actually did it, we, it was pretty dang close to, to what we estimated using that, uh, information. So we're giving accurate information and to our owner, um, you know, ahead of doing any of that work and then being able to communicate it to them well along the way. Um, so that was a, a great example right out of the gate. And then with the concrete pours, it was a, a prescient um, low bearing metal stud structure, um, which involves a lot of the, the steel posts. So when you have your podium slab, um, thousands of, of steel embeds right in, in every podium slab. So, and the elevation of those embeds is critical because it's all it, it all, you know, has to be within, like, I think it was like a half inch tolerance or less um, across the whole deck. So, um, and that's from one end of the deck to the other. So it, it's, there was a lot of, of pre-planning that went into all of those embeds and what was going into each of those labs and making sure that they were all gonna be, be right when the pressing structure showed up. So both before and after the pour, um, you know, we were able to, to document what was in those labs, where all the embeds were, overlay it with the the embed plans that um the bdc bdc team built um in real time before the four tell if any of them were off make adjustments um also check all of the the sleeves and the penetrations there were uh, a good amount of of hvac duct um you know penetrations that we had to to shift because they weren't installed in the right spot and we were able to catch it before the four um so that gets into the proactive you know i guess it, arena where we were catching the problems before there were problems. We were, were fixing it and then we would pour the deck and then we were able to fly it and then confirm that, that nothing moved, everything was where it should be and, and know that and have a level of comfort that when that structure showed up and they were ready to, 
to start the work that it was all going to be right and we weren't going to have any headaches or issues that we had to to adjust for so and that's just the first half of the job yeah, that's <laughs> right. and you guys did that's right uh, you know i'm a huge fan of all the the simplicity and value behind a facade flight and just flying those exteriors mm -hmm. of what seven eight stories and like just the way in which you captured them throughout the installation sequence like yeah I, I, it was just really really cool to to see all of that compiled into and it was what seven eight buildings on that you know campus yep. that yep. yeah it was just really cool to see that that job set the stage for a lot of the, the tools and processes we have right now so like one, one thing we do right now is using drones to do inspections and we knew on south carolina we had to do a laser scanning the the tolerances were so tight there were 1600 embeds on the whole project it was a quarter inch high and a quarter inch low tolerance and a quarter inch in either either direction and out of those 1600 there was one embed mm. that was wrong that one embed had a huge ripple impact into the the overall process but still being able to execute that on a 99.9 .9, whatever one out of 1600 is mm. um you know that level of accuracy was important but something we saw was the time it took to make the repairs when we noted it with the laser scanner. So that deck was all traditionally reinforced, a lot of rebar in the deck. And there was one area we had a drop slab and our edge of slab for like a, a balcony, an exterior balcony, the edge of slab was off. The amount of time it took to, you know, we caught it, we noted it, but it was a lot of work to go in and move all of the rebar, top mat, bottom mat, embeds, and you know tear it down and move it to get it in the right spot. Now, at the end of the day, it was right, but it wasn't the best thing for our people to catch it when we did. And we're like, how do we catch this sooner? How do we catch edge of slab busts before the day before we pour concrete? And we're like, well, we could laser scan more often, but that's a really technical procedure. You have to have specialized people who know how to operate the equipment. You have to have equipment available. And so we, we space our equipment out all over the Southeast to be available when it's needed. And it was going to be a huge change in how we have you know, our equipment plan to double, in essence, double the amount of laser scans we do just to do a second scan mm. early on. So we're like, well, you know, if you're edge of slat, like, we luckily we had a drone flight. And we're like, let's let's do an overlay of our edge of slab plan with this and see if it was something we could see from the drone. We're like, we saw the edge of slab bus from the drone. We're like, okay, so why don't we use drones to check our edge of slab? Why don't we use drones to check our penetrations before we put in all the rebar? Before that deck is tight? Before we spend three days putting in all that work? So that if there's something that's like fundamentally wrong, we can catch it and address it sooner. And that's now, you know, we, we identified that on the South Carolina project and now on the society Atlanta project, the 32 story high rise, every single deck gets checked with a drone first. So those decks are checked with the drone. We get a 360 walkthrough. We sign off on that. Then we proceed to release rebar and post tension cables and all that. And then finally we scan with the laser scanner because there's nothing that's going to be that millimeter accuracy you can get with the laser scanner and having that full comprehensive as built. But we don't want the laser scanner to be what is catching mistakes. So, you know, through that South Carolina project, we, we identified a, a bust, not, you know, we we're still delivering a high quality product, but it was taxing on our people, the sequence in which we were identifying those problems and reevaluated that process and worked a new technology in and kind of, we pushed the limits. We're like, I don't think drones, can do it, you know, if you have to fly above a tower crane, you might not get the, the pixel quality. So we're like, let's go get a Skydio drone. Let's go get a drone that can fly below this tower crane so we can still deliver that that quality and accuracy and confidence in these reports, but do it in a timely manner. Mm. Yeah, and on those elevated towers, right, the four sequences is so important. It's so fast, right, turning those those floors. So um, the, the solutions had to be um, solutions that didn't slow that sequence down, right? So the drone's able to be flown right there in the middle of that, you know, 10 minutes and, and checked in the office, you know, what, 15, 20 minutes later. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't slow the whole, the whole process down as we're going 
you know, going through it. So. You guys talked earlier about, uh, I keep going back to this, but the quality of life piece of like why technology is such a huge part of you guys uh, here at Juno. Talk a little bit about how confidence can be affected when you really start to infuse technology. Like you talk about how extensively you are documenting this. And I just think back of, man, if, if some of these tools were available back when, you know, we were doing some mm-hmm. things back in the day and like the confidence that that can bring and the quality of what you're installing, like yep. talk about that from the people perspective of what confidence can bring yeah, to I mean, a team. You know what's there, right? So if you don't, if you don't remember exactly where something was in a wall or in a slab, I mean, it's, it's quick to just jump in and look and see what's there. So, you know, that that's at your fingertips. It's no longer a question. It's, it's, it's there. That's where it is. We can go back and look and see. Um, I think it just makes, it, it makes everybody's life a little easier. It's just one less stressor that the guys have to worry about in the field. Yeah. Uh, we're getting close on time and I want to make sure we get you out of here by, uh, by three. I have a one more question because I tend to, I tend to steal the mic a little bit from Bryant, which I, I, I've learned over a season or two, but do you I'm have just, anything? I'm just here to hang out. I just <laughs> like to hang out. Uh, I'm, I'm curious. Um, the question I was going to ask you was around, um, as you kind of think about other, um, other companies or other peers that you have in the industry, like what, what advice would you give to other companies that are either tuning in and listening to, you know, episodes like this and they hear this and they're like, man, like the stuff, Greg and Wilson, the stuff they're doing is awesome. Like where, where would they start? Where should they start? Or what are some things that you've learned along the way around some of these ideas, reality capture quality of life for some of these like folks that are using it? Like, yeah, I mean, I think I would, I would start by focusing on your people, right. And focusing on what, what communicate with your people, listen to them and find out where their pain points are. What's, what's, making their their day-to-day stressful what what are the things that are are causing headaches for them in the field and making making them lose sleep at night right and then then try and figure out solutions that you know help help with solving those problems and not focusing on the the cool new flashy software but focusing on what really does what really does make my people's lives easier and and focus on you know start by going straight to your people and finding out what their pain points are and what's causing them to lose sleep at night yeah and to add to that too like how do you do that? Like, how have you found effectiveness in asking those questions or finding out those? Obviously, you have yeah. <laughs> amazing resource in Wilson, but like for you personally, how do you, how do you go out and get some of that feedback? I mean, it's just going and talking to our guys, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's uh, I think it's it's part of the culture, right? It's a it's a part of being approachable as as leaders of the company. I mean, we're we're completely open minded, and and if if you know, somebody has an idea, they're, they're not afraid to bring it to, a, to our attention and they're not afraid to tell us what they're really feeling and thinking because, you know, there's no judgment here. We're going to you know, help them solve the problems if, if they've got one and, and work through it together. So I think creating that culture where people are not afraid to tell you what they're really feeling and, and to not afraid to bring ideas to you, no matter how small or crazy they seem at the time. I mean, that's, that's, it goes back to the culture. Brian? I, I'm gonna I, look. I had I mean, one I, other question that I was gonna look up. Too. I didn't want to pull up my phone. I mean, but. honestly, I I just want to say like I know both of your positions are very service facing. It's like our people. You're you're constantly in positions where you're thinking of other people. But I would say you know you should definitely be very proud of yourselves of what you've been able to create here as far as a culture because you know something you really do notice as an outsider is I went to four different sites and everybody had the same exact mentality and attitude and they were not working day to day with each other. Mm-hmm. Right. Awesome. And a culture get, you can get really get told of how a culture is defined by like those remote projects that are out you know, in their own world. And mm-hmm. you know, they, your culture is defined by their most senior person in that trailer. And I, I would say here truly from every single person on that field team, like really did eat, live and breathe what they were saying about like the Juno culture. And I, I felt it, you know, yeah, I, I just thought that you guys should definitely be proud of yourselves. Yeah, it's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's a uh, amazing to hear. It's it's a hard thing to maintain, but you know, Greg, have, having it come from, you know, I can say it having it come from Greg and the executive level, like it's not something that's it's not a marketing ploy. It's not. It's lived and breathed by everybody that we work with, and 
you know, we're, we're trying to deliver the same experience, whether you're in South Carolina, Knoxville, Tennessee, Atlanta, Georgia, Miami, like you, you, you saw it on, on one of the job sites. Like how many job sites did we have that had the little cafe Cito <laughs> drinks, yeah. like start in our Miami office. And we, we have like our South Carolina guys, we got a, you know, somebody from North Carolina making a Miami Cuban style <laughs> coffee, <laughs> um, having competitions about, about making it and, you know, keeping it fun is, uh, you know, a fundamental value about Juno. Like we, we live and breathe keeping it fun because building is stressful, but you have to be able to enjoy it. Yep. Yeah. And I like the metric you were saying it, if they're smiling while doing it, then that's probably a good metric yeah. for, for technology. Yeah, I love that. And, and we like, when we are walking around job sites this week, Greg, like we just, we just mic'd people up, like yeah. told them like, Hey, can you give us like a, just take us on a quick little tour and you know, unbeknownst to them, we mic'd them up and we're like, we're going to, we're going to capture what you're saying. So we have some like really great raw content of our guys, like, <laughs> and they didn't know. Um, something I thought that was interesting though, too, is like, we, we asked everybody, okay, so, you know, you're sitting on society Atlanta. It's the, the tallest project in, in company history, 32 story high rise in, in midtown. Like what's next? I'm like, let's go taller. You know, yeah. Qu Quentin's already, he's like, I want to go to 60 stories. I see right. it. Uh, you know, he just did 19 stories. He's doing 32 stories. He's like, what's, what's the next one? What's next? You know, you've got the, the South Carolina team that was the biggest contract in company history. And now we, yeah, we've got an even bigger one. That's like, right. Yeah. It was the largest, it was the largest, uh, student housing project in the state of South Carolina history. So yeah. And, and yeah. you know, next there is an even bigger student housing. Project. That's right. Like it just, it just keeps going up and there's, Everybody here, like they can be working on the highest profile project and they're still wanting to do a better job and they're still wanting to deliver more, yeah. which is amazing. I think the two words, and I, we'll, we'll close it out here to, to let you go, is, is, is just contagious culture. Like, I, I think that is something that is so hard in our industry is getting culture right, spreading the culture, and then man maintaining that. And it, it's been very clear and obvious in the two short days that we've been here that we've gotten to see that from your teams and, and kudos to you. I mean, and kudos to the two of y'all. Uh, it's, it's fun to see. It's, it's encouraging to be on our side to help continue to make tools to help make those individuals lives better. And that's a huge part of what we're trying to do over on this side too, but it's even more rewarding when we get to see that uh, in, in the real world of happening awesome. too. So um, thank y'all one <laughs> again, we are literally in Juno's podcast studio. If you are just listening and not watching with us. Uh, and so this is one amazing. And two, thank y'all for the time. Uh, it's just really fun to, to get to catch up and Brian, any, any closing thoughts? Nope. I, I came up with contagious culture. I feel like you got to come up with a, a little, what, well, I mean, what were your takeaways the last, I mean, I need to get in some cafecito. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes. We need to go to Miami next to yep. do some job set business down there. Well, well, thank you for tuning in uh, with us on this episode. We hope to see you guys here on the next one. And thank you guys again. We appreciate the time. Thanks, Grant. Yeah, Thanks, awesome. Brian. Thanks. Thank you. Make sure to subscribe to Built Different on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and anywhere you listen to podcasts. Let's build this community together.